Uh, firstly, welcome to this development seminar. Uh, today's seminar is on Islamophobia in the name of women's rights. Our speaker is Sarah Ferris, who is a senior lecturer in the sociology department at Goldsmiths, University of London. She is the author of Max Weber's Theory of Personality, Individuation, Politics and Orientalism in the Sociology of Religion, which was published, published in 2013, and In the Name of Women's Rights, The Rise of Femonationalism, which was published this year. Uh, her discussant is Lindsay German, uh, an activist and an academic, a lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire, and a founding member of the Stop the Walk Coalition, and a prominent organizer of demonstrations against Islamophobia. So uh, Sarah will give her talk, followed by a response from the discussants, and then we will open up the floor for your questions. Uh, if you want to tweet during this seminar, the hashtags are hashtag SOSDevStudies and hashtag ESRC. So, Sarah? Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Okay. So, first of all, thanks a lot, Faisy, for inviting me and the Development Studies uh, Department here at SOAS. It's really an honor to be here, and uh, wow, look at you. I mean, so many people. I wasn't expecting this crowd, so it's, uh, it's great. Um, so, today, uh, what I, I want to do is really, um, I'm presenting my book, the book I've just published, so I want to give you a bit of... Uh, not of a, a summary of the book, but I want to go through especially what are the main points. And uh, I'd like to have a discussion um, with you about this. But I thought I would begin by telling you a bit about what prompted me to write this book in the first place. So it was uh, 2011. It was a time when I was not living in this country. And together with colleagues, we organized a conference on the mobilization of women's rights by various right-wing parties across Europe. Uh, the, the book by Jasbir Puar on homonationalism, which some of you might be familiar with, had just been published in 2007. And in this book, for those of you who are not familiar with the work of Jasbir Puar, she analyzed, she uses the notion of homonationalism to analyze the, what she calls the collusions between um, homonormativity, homonormative frameworks, and American nationalism. More precisely, she looks at the ways in which American nationalism, uh, particularly after 9-11, began foregrounding Muslims as homophobic, and instead portraying the United States as the country of gay rights and gay liberation. But also she looks at some of the collusions between some sections of the gay movement in the United States and American nationalism. So what was interesting about her book was that she was among the first to, um, I would say, to highlight, to look at the ways in which uh, emancipatory projects uh, such as gay rights uh, were instrumentalized by non-emancipatory uh, political formations or within non-emancipatory political frameworks. Uh, and, and also, lots of work had begun to be, was done uh, about the ways in which the feminist emancipatory projects had been mobilized increasingly within non-emancipatory frameworks. Uh, and obviously, I'm thinking Talking about 9-11, uh, I'm thinking of the ways in which the war in Afghanistan, the bombing on, Af on Afghanistan had been justified uh, in the name of women's rights, in the name of liberating women from the burqa. So all these discussions were there and uh, we, my colleagues and myself working on this conference were quite uh, um, keen on understanding what was going on. For me, it was also an opportunity to um, somehow bring together different parts of my work because I am a gender and migration scholar and uh, I also work on a representation of migrant and Muslim women. So I was particularly struck also in light of my work by all the ways in which uh, the representation of migrant and Muslim women was increasingly appropriated within these Islamophobic uh, discourses. So, um, I just want to give you maybe some examples of what exactly I mean for, for those of you who might not necessarily be familiar with uh, what I mean by how these right-wing parties are appropriating uh, uh, women's equality or, or, or gender equality issues within Islamophobic frameworks. This is a poster from the Northern League, which is an it the Italian anti-immigration far-right party. And this poster is from 2006. 
um, it was the time in which there were discussions in Europe about the possibility of allowing uh, Turkey to enter into the European Union, and this is what the Northern League uh, writes. It, it, the, the message is very, very clear. If you allow Turkey to enter into the European Union, this is what will happen to women in Italy, or to white women, to European women. So they will be turned into veiled women just behind, in, in a cage, basically. This is Marine Le Pen. Uh, she is, uh, uh, as you know, the... Um, the leader of the Front National, the National Front, the far right party in France. And as she says, I'm scared of the migrants' crisis signals the beginning of the end of women's rights. Now, what's striking again here that is that the National Front in France is not exactly famous for being a party that cares about women. It's been considered uh, usually a quite homophobic but also misogynist party. And so this sudden endorsement of women's rights by Marine Le Pen, uh, again, was, as you can see, is just conceived within the framework of bashing migrants. And the final example I have today is, uh, um, the graphic example at least, is from, uh, again, Italy. Um, Again, the message I think is very, very clear. This woman is Laura, an Italian name, an Italian woman, and uh, she, the, the, the reason why she's like that is because she married Ahmed, obviously an Arab sounding name. What's interesting here, I didn't have a more graphic example to show actually what I'm going to say, but is that um, all these examples, well, apart from the one in the case of Marine Le Pen, but these examples show the ways in which Muslims in particular have been foregrounded, male Muslims have been foregrounded as sexual threats or threats to, um, to Europe more generally. But these discourses, as I will try to say also today, they actually apply to non-Western migrants more generally. So one of the things that I want to discuss is the ways in which this gender dichotomy that it's been constructed by these parties, and not only these parties, in which the migrant Muslim non-Western, non-white man is portrayed as the threat, and the migrant Muslim non-Western, non-white woman is portrayed as a victim, is something that we see very visibly and very vocally in the case of Muslims, but it doesn't, it's not a discourse that is made just in the case of Muslims. And uh, I'd like maybe to have a discussion about all of this. Um, so, <coughs> these things I'm showing you, the ways in which these parties are mobilizing, uh, uh, have mobilized the women's rights against Muslims and immigrants, uh, has been analyzed also by other scholars. I'm certainly not the only one who has been uh, studying this. Uh, what I found, one of the reasons that also prompted me to, to write this book, was that I, um, I was not entirely happy with the way in which these, um, these analyses were, were done in a way, by which I mean that I thought there was a tendency to overestimate, or at least to overemphasize the political dimensions and the political implications of all of, of these discourses, which, don't get me wrong, are absolutely important and crucial, particularly after 9-11, is obviously, the war on terror obviously plays a, a prominent role within, within these discourses. But at the same time, uh, particularly as someone who belongs to that strand of feminist theory, that is uh, social reproduction feminism, Mar Marxist feminism, I was particularly interested to see if we could find also a political economic logic to understand uh, these discourses. If uh, we could also see somehow um, how this uh, uh, ideology that was increasingly uh, present and uh, widespread in Europe uh, uh, could somehow be read also in light of political economy. So that's really what uh, uh, this book is trying to do. So I, the book's focus is really an analysis of the convergence on anti-Islam politics by three very different political agendas in France, <coughs> Netherlands and Italy. So I focus exclusively on, on these three countries, although as uh, maybe we can discuss in the Q&A, uh, there are possibilities also to, for generalizations or in any case for discussions also about how these issues and these phenomena play out also in other countries. And in particular, I look at the convergence um, 
among the three, uh, these three actors, right-wing nationalists, some feminists and femocrats, and uh, by femocrats I mean female bureaucrats in gender equality state agencies, and finally neoliberal policies. So what I, I've been really trying to understand is how is that these three very different political formations and political agendas tend to converge when it comes to describing Muslim men in particular as a sexual threat, as misogynists and oppressors of women, and Muslim women in particular as victims to be rescued. So the book is also an attempt to understand particularly the political economy of these rescue narratives, so-called rescue narratives. I want to give you here some examples. When I say that some feminists, prominent feminists, have been part of this um, of this ideology, of this way of portraying Muslims as a sexual threat for women. This is perhaps one of the most prominent and clear uh, examples, which is Elisabeth Badinter. She's a very famous French feminist philosopher, very famous in France, but I would say also in the English-speaking world because her work has been translated also into English. So this is what she writes in 2010 when asked by the French government to give a statement as to why the government should ban the full veil in public spaces. This is what she says. In this possibility to be, of being looked at without being seen and to look at the other without him, her being able to see you, I see the satisfaction of a triple perverse enjoyment. The enjoyment of one's supremacy over the other the enjoyment of the exhibitionist and the enjoyment of the voyeur. I think we are dealing with very sick women and I do not think that we have to be determined according to their pathology. So that's what she stands for. And again, as I said, she is a very prominent feminist, not a right-wing feminist, although perhaps after this text we might suspect that that's not exactly the case. But in any case, she is not identified in France as right-wing, as she does not identify herself as right-wing. So one of the things perhaps I should say is that when I look at the, the feminist, what I call the anti-Islam feminist front, we are not dealing just with self-identifying right-wing feminists uh, or self-identifying right-wing femocrats, those who work in, in um, gender equality state agencies, but also often uh, left-wing feminists. I'm not saying they are the majority, uh, but they have been very vocal in the last 10 years, and certainly they have been given a prominent space within the mainstream media. I want to give you, um, this is an example of uh, um, a neoliberal policy, because as I said, I'm looking at the convergence among the nationalist feminists, and now I want to give you an example of a neoliberal policy document to start explaining a little bit to you what I mean by this. Um, this is perhaps, uh, it will take me some time to explain how this is neoliberal, but um, this is basically comes from a booklet, is in French, and it comes from a booklet which, is, uh, um, which targets migrants. It is given to migrants as soon as they arrive in France. And it is given to them within the framework of the so-called civic integration programs. Now, these programs are increasingly have been increasingly implemented across Europe. You have something similar here in the UK, although there are also differences uh, with these other documents. But basically, the, the thing this document says is quite, in a way, even in innocent. So it says, uh, if you're a migrant, you come to this country, you need to understand that men and women are equal. So. We can say that uh, on the surface uh, there is nothing wrong in telling people that women and men are equal and women should be respected. The problem comes because uh, the ways in which the, the gender equality framework is foregrounded within these uh, uh, civic integration programs uh, is done in a way, is premised upon the idea and the assumption that these migrants do not, do not know anything about women's rights that they need to be taught what gender equality is about because they are assumed not only to be ignorant about gender equality but also to be misogynist. 
So there, there are all these assumptions within the civic integration materials. <coughs> and uh, the other reason why um, these civic integration materials are neoliberal, actually the main reason, is because, as I will explain a little bit more uh, in a second, they are framed within a workfare logic, which is a neoliberal workfare logic, according to which, in order to be rescued from these misogynist frameworks, these migrant women need not only to integrate by acknowledging that they live in a country that celebrates women's rights, but also they need to work, so they can't be a burden for the, the welfare state, they need to integrate economically. So I will talk a little bit more about this because obviously this in many ways is the core of my argument and it goes at the core of this political economic logic of what I'm trying to say. So these are the three driving questions of my book. Why are these different movements invoking the same trope and identifying Muslim men as one of the most dangerous threats to Western societies? Are we witnessing the rise of a new unholy alliance or is this seeming consensus across the political spectrum merely coincidental and contingent? And why are Muslim women being presented with offers of emancipation and even rescue in a context of rising Islamophobia and anti-immigration sentiments, particularly regarding employment and welfare? So these are the questions that uh, I try to address in this book. In order to answer these questions, I coined this term which is femonationalism, which as you can tell echoes the concept of homonationalism that was very much an inspiration in many ways for my work, although there are also several differences between my work and just Birkhoa's work as we perhaps will discuss in the Q&A. So, for femonationalism, um, what I mean, this is a concept is short for Feminist and Femocratic Nationalism, it refers both to the exploitation of feminist themes by nationalists and neoliberals in anti-Islam, but as I will show and as I said already, also anti-immigration <coughs> campaigns, and to the participation of certain feminists and femocrats in the stigmatization of Muslim men under the banner of gender equality. Femonationalism thus describes, on the one hand, the attempts of Western European right-wing parties and neoliberals to advance xenophobic and racist politics through the touting of gender equality, while on the other hand it captures the involvement of various well-known and quite visible feminists and femocrats in the current framing of Islam as a quintessential misogynistic religion and culture. So with this concept I, I try to capture Particularly this convergence I've been talking about to you and I, I've been giving uh, uh, you examples. <coughs> My point in the book is that femonationalism, um, and this is one of the difference I, differences I have with just Pouar, cannot be simply understood as a free-floating discourse, as something that somehow belongs just to this mainstream media. But I conceive of it as an ideology, an ideological formation that springs from a specific mode of encounter, or what I prefer to call a convergence, and I will explain to you in a second why, amongst different political projects, and that is produced by and productive of a specifically economic logic. So in the rest of this presentation, I want to explain particularly two things. Why femonationalism is a convergence, and why and in what sense it is a neoliberal political economy. I will go very briefly on why it is a convergence. So, I was telling you at the beginning uh, the, um, the concept of homonationalism that was introduced by Jasbir Puar was precisely trying to understand the association between gay rights and gay movements and American nationalism. When she studied uh, um, this these association, just before talks of collusion, so she, in a way, thinks that this association also, there is an a, a implicit or sometimes explicit intention by some sectors of the gay movements themselves to associate with these, with these nationalist frameworks. 
The other concept uh, beside collusion that's been used to understand that some of these uh, weird associations, these kind of un unholy alliances, was that of instrumentalization. And this is also something I use sometimes. So we often hear how right-wing parties are instrumentalizing women's rights, how they are exploiting women's rights. And these, for example, uh, this is a concept that was used by Liz Fekete, who you might know. She is or she was the director of the, the Race Studies Center here in the UK. And she wrote a wonderful article on what she calls enlightened fundamentalism, and trying also to make sense of some of the things I've been describing. Now, I wasn't too convinced by these two concepts for the following reasons. First, I don't think uh, uh, that uh, the association between the feminists, the democrats, the nationalists uh, and neoliberals that I describe, at least in the context that, that I study, are actually necessarily colluding. I think that in many ways uh, they are converging on this Islamophobic space, sometimes even in spite of the intentions of the actors. So the feminists don't want to be associated necessarily with these right-wing nationalists, and the right-wing nationalists are attacking the feminists in many ways. So I thought it was more precise to talk about the convergence. There is also a more complex uh, theoretical reason why I do that, but perhaps if someone asks me the question during the Q&A, we can go into that. And I thought, I don't talk so much about instrumentalization, because uh, this would also be patronizing, uh, particularly towards the feminists, because I think that these feminists, even though they are not necessarily colluding with these nationalists, but there are specific reasons why they are framing Islam as misogynist and as a particular threat for gender equality in the West. So it's not just about being instrumentalized. These are the general reasons why I prefer to talk about convergence. Um, but I want to spend more time explaining to you why I talk about female nationalism as neoliberal political economy. As I said, there have been studies already that try to understand these uh, convergences, associations, uh, and as I said already, the majority of them have particularly emphasized uh, the political aspects, and they have used uh, a political framework to understand these, uh, these, these uh, associations. So I, I could say that the, the main contribution that my book does is really that of trying to, um, to introduce this political economic lens into the discussion. There have been, however, a few studies that also have tried to take uh, um, the political economy, the economic aspects, uh, into account. Um, and here I'm thinking of the work of uh, Sirma Bilge, who is a Canadian feminist, who also tried to understand the association between some Canadian feminists and the Canadian nationalists against Muslims in the Canadian context. She tries to understand how neoliberalism plays a role into this. But somehow my feeling with the works that have been done on this is that they tend to treat neoliberalism as the economic theater of operation for the encounter between this different array of forces, but not as one of the main characters on stage. So while I agree that neoliberalism is central for understanding this phenomena, I argue that neoliberalism is not simply the contextual ground on which the female nationalist convergence takes place, but it is itself constitutive of such a convergence. When I say the contextual ground, maybe I should give an example, otherwise this could sound a bit obscure. Um, those uh, scholars who say neoliberalism actually uh, can help us to understand the association between these different forces, basically they say neoliberalism creates the conditions of possibility between these, for, for these associations, for these kind of collusions, because neoliberalism tends to foreground the cultural elements, and so is very, in a way, is the, um, a very fertile soil for forms of cultural racism, because within neoliberalism we don't want to talk about the material 
conditions or the uh, economic um, uh, aspects or the structural aspects behind, for instance, racism. So in this sense, by treating neoliberalism as this kind of uh, horizon, culturalist horizon within which uh, we need to understand these forms of uh, racism, it seems to me that they are capturing something. I'm not saying that there is not these aspects, but we are not really looking at specific neoliberal policies. We are not really looking at what neoliberalism is actually doing in terms of facilitating concretely these types of associations. So this is what I've tried to do. And this is basically my main argument in the book. And now I want to explain to you in what sense I think female nationalism needs to be understood in terms of political economy. Now, um, this is a specific example that comes from the Netherlands, one of the countries uh, on which I, uh, one of the countries that I investigated in my work. So in 2007, what was the Minister of Education, Culture and Science, which was also responsible for gender equality, so it was the democratic uh, um, component, so they launched the so-called 1001 Force Project, which had previously been designed by the Pavan Commission. The Pavan Commission was a commission specifically uh, designed to, to um, address the problems of integration of migrant and ethnic minority women in the, in, in the Netherlands. So this project, this 1001 Force Project, which uh, you might detect already the Orientalist undertone, the thousand and one night. <laughs> so, so this project sought to encourage women undergoing civic integration programs to participate in civil society by explicitly inviting these women to undertake volunteer work. So in a bizarre twist of means and ends, unpaid volunteer work was presented as the main way for reaching the goal of economic independence. So one of the things I did in this, uh, in, this, in this project, as I told you at the beginning, uh, as I mentioned briefly, um, I looked specifically at these so-called civic integration programs. Now to, get, to give you a little bit more details about these programs, basically they ask uh, um, migrants uh, since 2006, all up in, in different European countries, uh, immigration and integration policies have merged, which means that now migrants, particularly those coming for family reunification, which often tend to be women, they are asked, they have to demonstrate uh, uh, to be integrated in order to be given residency rights. This works in different ways in different countries, but the logic is the same for all of them. No, so how can they demonstrate to be integrated? For example, in the Netherlands, they arrive and they need to go through a number of, they need to attend courses, which sometimes are quite expensive, in which they learn the Dutch language and they also learn about the history uh, and the values of the Netherlands. So they need, first of all, to be familiarized with uh, uh, these cultures and values. And at the end of these three years, uh, this is the time they have to be integrated. Uh, they have to do a test, and this test asks them about the history of the country, they test the level of language, and uh, they test also things like, uh, have you been involved in your children's education, have you gone to see the teacher of your children, if they have children, so they are quite, they also want these women to develop a, a portfolio of their integration. And gender equality is very prominent in all of this, and as I said, they even want these women to watch videos, women and men actually, in which they are told, uh, um, oh, maybe in your country it is normal to be subject to domestic violence, but we actually take it seriously and uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have laws against it. So again, it is premised on the idea that these people somehow come from countries in which it is normal to bash women. And as I said, this is incredibly strong within the civic integration programs. But there are not just uh, cultural aspects uh, of these programs. Uh, the economic aspects of this program has been completely uh, understudied, but it's actually very, very important. So particularly since 2007, 
as, um, the European Integration Fund has been instituted, which is a fund which is um, it's been instituted specifically to basically give money to organizations and programs all across Europe to facilitate the integration of migrants. Now, what is interesting about this civic integration, uh, this in, um, European Integration Fund, is that they um, tend to privilege, or at least to give uh, lots of prominence to programs particularly targeting migrant women. The idea is women in particular need to be emancipated, integrated, precisely because they come from these non-emancipative cultures. But also there is lots of emphasis uh, in the idea that women, these migrant women, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, they need to find a job. The premise again is that they don't work, probably they don't have work experience because they come from backward cultures and they come from contexts in which they are not allowed to work. So these programs give lots of emphasis to the idea that these women need to find jobs because they need to be emancipated. Because you know, the economic integration is the best way to emancipate for a woman, to, to be economically independent, to be autonomous and so forth. So what I did is I looked specifically at the programs funded within the European Integration Fund and I, I went to see what these programs do. So for example, you find that in, in the Netherlands, these funds have been given to specific um, women's organizations or migrants' organizations very often, and sometimes very good organizations. And uh, they have been given for these organizations to develop initiatives and programs to help these women to find a job. So one of the things that they did, for example, but this was actually a governmental program, partly funded by the European Integration Fund, was to ask these women to volunteer uh, to, to, in order to gain those skills uh, that uh, they need in order to find a job in the labor market. And this is already very paradoxical because uh, all of this emancipation discourse for these migrant women was foregrounded as a way for these women to be economically independent. So it's absurd to say you need to be economically independent and then to actually ask them to volunteer, which is not exactly again, allowing them to get any economic independence. But what struck me, and I think it's even more important to understand about these programs, is that when you look at the jobs that these women are systematically, and I want to stress, systematically channeled to do, it is always jobs as babysitters, cleaners within, in private households or in hotels, and elderly carers. So they are all exclusively jobs in the so-called social reproductive sphere. So this, for example, is from um, an Italian organization which is called Nosotras. It's an organization composed of Italian and migrant women, particularly from South America, but not only. And this is a report, you can actually find it online. It's a report in which the organization is reporting <coughs> on what they did with these European integration funds. So they say, this is how they, we used this money. Uh, we accompanied migrant women to the job interviews. So we helped, for example, with uh, translations. If they couldn't speak Italian, we tried to help them in this way and so forth. And this is what one of the uh, women who actually, she is uh, a member of the organization. She is uh, uh, probably, uh, actually, I remember, she is a migrant uh, who's been living in Italy for a long time. And she says, uh, I accompany migrant women to the job interview. In almost all cases, it is for care and domestic work. So just to give you an example of how actually, uh, these are the only jobs that are actually left for these women. So one of the things that I, um, that I try to say in this book, that what I find extremely paradoxical and actually what I call a performative contradiction is the, way, the, the ways in which feminists and femocrats in particular urge emancipation for Muslim and non-Western migrant women while channeling them towards the very sphere from which the feminist movement had historically tried to liberate women. So this is not just a rhetorical contradiction, but is concretely performed in action. 
So in other words, there has been so much talk about emancipating Muslim women, emancipating migrant women, but when we look concretely at the ways in which this emancipation takes place, it is particularly in those sectors very low paid, with a very low status, that have no recognition from society and in many ways are not even considered work, that, and also that have been uh, attacked particularly by the feminist movement as non-emancipatory for women. So I, I, I really want to highlight what I find a very disturbing <coughs> contradiction. But it's not just the feminists who have this contradiction. And here there is another aspect of this political economy, of this ideology that I want to, I would like you to understand, and is really at the core of my argument in, in the book. As I said, the, the parties, the nationalist right-wing parties that I analyze, they, um, as, you, as you might imagine, and as you probably know, they have particularly used a very strong anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, so, in a way, one of the, quest the driving questions I had in, in this book, as I told you at the beginning, was how is that these parties have this very strong anti-immigration rhetoric, but then they talk about migrant women as victims to be rescued. So there is this kind of gendered dichotomy, a gendered, uh, we can say, double standard, which is applied within these uh, uh, racist discourses. But again, here, it's not just about discourse. There are very concretely, very concrete material uh, interests and very concrete uh, economic logics behind. This, for me, is one of the quintessential examples. It's a statement from Roberto Maroni, who was the leader of the far-right-wing party Northern League. I already showed you one, one of their posters. <coughs> and he said this in 2009 when he was the Ministry of the Interior, so in the most prominent position in the country, dealing with immigration. 2009, uh, just remember, was the midst of the global economic crisis, and it was a time in Italy as in other European countries that we, where governments were increasingly talking about stopping quotas for immigration, the political spectrum was going uh, more right-wing uh, because in the midst of the crisis there is a tendency to scapegoat migrants uh, for the economic crisis. So in Italy this discourse was particularly harsh also because we had a right-wing government and uh, they, they continually said we don't want any more migrants coming into this country and we are not going to do an amnesty for the migrants who are illegally present in the country because we, ha we want jobs for Italians first. But he says, so there cannot be a regularization for those who entered illegally, for those who rape a woman, so again, see how easily this association is made, the migrant is a sexual threat, or for those who rob a villa. But certainly we will take into account all those situations that have a strong social impact, as in the case of migrant caregivers. So in 2009, there was an exceptional regularization done only for migrant women, because they work as caregivers in the country. They are so-called badanti, uh, which means that they especially work for children and elderly people within Italian families. So these right-wing parties were willing to close an eye to the anti-immigration rhetoric, uh, particularly in the case of these women, because they are essential to the economies of these countries. These countries simply cannot uh, reproduce themselves, uh, literally, on a daily basis. They cannot provide the care needed for elderly people, for children, uh, the, the, the cleaning of households, hotels, and so forth, the preparations of foods, if it were not for these migrant women. And just think also of, of this is really one of the things that prompted this uh, political economic understanding of this phenomena. Just think of the ways in which even here in Britain, particularly after Brexit, but not just after Brexit, there has been lots of rhetoric and talk about how migrants are reducing the wages of native workers or stealing jobs from native workers. And I have to say, even within the Labour Party, this discourse has been very kind of vague. There have been at times also, even recently, um, they have also um, somehow reinforced these kind of ideas, which are totally denied by the majority of studies 
that I have done work in trying to understand whether actually migrants lower wages or not. But this is another story that again we can discuss in the Q&A. But what I want to say is that when you think of this, this course is about migrants lowering wages or stealing jobs, usually what we have in mind is the migrant man. So just think even of UKIP. There is a famous poster by UKIP that shows a British man begging on the street. I don't know if you remember that poster. But in any case, even if you don't remember, the point is uh, in the public imagery, the idea of the migrant who steals a job is always a male migrant. It's never a female migrant. And in fact, uh, even when Corbyn tries to say, oh, migrants are really useful for the economy, the example he makes is all, always that of nurses who are, uh, in the majority of times, uh, female. So what I'm trying to say, and I really want to go to my conclusions now, is that... I think the main reason why, not perhaps the main is too strong, but one of the, the most important reasons why the, there is this gender double standard that is applied to migrant men and migrant women, I believe it is because uh, the women are playing a very different role within the contemporary European economies. There is a willingness to say we want to rescue them, we want to emancipate them, we want to integrate them, because actually we need them to carry out and to carry on doing these jobs and this work which is essential for the reproduction of our economy. So if I had to give you like the perhaps one paragraph, um, perhaps summarizing the main argument of my book, I would say it is this, which is the double standard applied to Muslim and non-Western migrant women in the public imaginary as individuals in need of special attention and even rescue operates as an ideological tool that is strictly connected to their key role, present or future, in the reproduction of the material conditions of social reproduction. Femonationalism should be understood as part and parcel of the specifically neoliberal reorganization of welfare, labor and state immigration policies that have occurred in the context of the global financial crisis and more generally the Western European crisis of social reproduction. So that's why I think uh, um, this political economic framework is actually very important to understand what's going on. Thank you very much for this. And uh, we'll now hand over to the discussant. Okay. Um, I, I would very much like to thank, firstly, uh, Sarah for that uh, very, very interesting talk and for the book and to the uh, development studies uh, people for, for laying this on for Daisy in particular for inviting me. I just, in the few minutes that I've got, it's very hard to kind of cover uh, more than a few points. So I hope that, uh, and obviously lots of people have lots of things to say. I, I just wanted to make a few points in response to what, uh, to what Sarah said and to maybe bring out a few things which perhaps we can, we can discuss a little bit. The first is to really talk a little bit about this question of the sexualization of racism, which, uh, which it, uh, uh, when you look at racism and sexism has often been connected, you know, there's always been the sort of uh, the discourse about black men being sexually aggressive to white women, which was something that was common in the uh, United States, but, uh, and in Britain for that matter. But I think with Islamophobia in the uh, era of neoliberalism, I think we've got the most sexualized uh, racism that we've we've really seen, and it's it's portrayed in all sorts of different ways. As Sarah has said, it's portrayed in terms of the um, the male migrants and Muslims who are predatory, who are rapists. Or uh, she didn't talk about it, but we're all aware of these cases where the grooming cases of mainly Muslim where men grooming young teenage white girls. Those those kind of things. Is this this on the one hand, and on the other hand, women who somehow were forced to wear veils or forced to wear the niqab or, or the burqa or whatever it is. And this kind of discourse, I think, is fantastically 
important in the whole way in which Islamophobia is being used. And particularly, one of the things it's also perhaps worth commenting on is the number of far-right female politicians that there are now, if you think not just Marine Le Pen, but in the AFD in Germany, in the, a whole number of different parties. So I think that's something that's very, very interesting to kind of think about when we think about um, Islamophobia. And also, I think the role of the state in promoting some of these ideas, which, you know, Sarah talked about the different elements of... Uh, of uh, female nationalism, but I think this role of the state in terms of the prevent program, in terms of uh, its justification for wars or for immigration controls or any of the things that it, that it talks about, I think is very, very much a question that how it, it, it instrumentalises this idea of, of Muslim women in particular to, to do those sorts of things. I, I wanted to make a couple of points about some of the issues to do with work because I think it's very, very interesting, this point about workfare, which is, is a general thing about neoliberalism. I mean, obviously, it's been talked about today in terms of migrant women, but it's true in general that work makes you free in, in neoliberal society, that everybody has to work and that even if you're disabled, even if you want to stay at home with your children, this is a luxury which is denied you unless you are very, very fortunate indeed and that you're, uh, you're in this sort of process of, of workfare. And this is the idea that for women who are migrants to this country or to any other, that somehow the... Um, the, the path to sort of liberation is that you get a job where you're paid minimum wage, where you're working in very insecure conditions and that you're subject to all the problems that people are faced with at work is, is a grotesque distortion of, of any idea of work being, uh, being, a liberating, uh, being a liberating thing. I think that it's, um, it's also something I don't quite think you can... I, I don't know if Sarah was, was, was saying this. I don't think you can quite assume that second wave feminism was about just getting women into work. There was a big element of women's right to work, but there was also um, big elements of nursery rights, of equal pay, of some of those sorts of things. And, and to me, as somebody who was part of that generation, I think it's always been about women's choice as to whether or not they wanted to work. And we see this now very, very clearly, that maternity leave you can have for a short period of time, but don't do it for too long because you'll lose your career pathways, you'll lose, uh, but you may lose your job, although it's illegal, although it's one of the things we don't really uh, talk about, but, um, but actually there's a huge problem with women wanting to have maternity leave. There's a huge problem with the gender pay gap in this country, which is the figures released last week show it's got worse again, particularly for younger women. So... This idea that this is ideal of Western society where women really do have it all and have achieved it all and somehow the women who are coming from these benighted poor countries and suffering from domestic violence is something that's, that's alien to women in Britain just simply isn't true. What is it? One or two women a week who are killed uh, as a result of domestic violence. I mean, these are huge things. But it's always now put in terms of the... Um, in terms of... It's people who aren't part of Western society, Western civilization, who carry those things out. So I think, it's, I think we need to look at what's happening, not just in terms of it's a kind of continuum of second wave feminism, because there was always divisions in terms of second wave feminism. And I think that even today, those who regard themselves as socialist feminists or Marxist feminists or on the left generally, would reject the view of Muslim women, or most of them, I think, would reject. But particularly in Britain, it may be different perhaps in France. I know that you know, there's, there's actually much more sort of um, problems with those sorts of uh, those questions in France. But I think in Britain that is true. At the same time, there's a division within feminism where a section of feminists have identified very, very clearly with neoliberal aims and who have seen themselves as this is about individual women's progression rather than the whole of the mass of women really uh, succeeding in, uh, in going forward. So uh, that, I think, is another thing that I'd, I'd be interested to hear what, um, what Sarah thinks about it. And just perhaps finally, the whole question of social reproduction and work. I think it's absolutely true in terms of the women that you're describing. I'm not sure, if you look again at Britain, if you look at, say, Muslim women and 
uh, migrant non-Western women, which are the categories you talk about in the book, um, in terms of both of them obviously being victims of, of racism and so on. I'm not... I mean, there are differences here. For example, in this country, there are very big, settled uh, Muslim communities, particularly Pakistani, Bangladeshi, uh, Gujarati, and, and, and so on, whose work isn't just... I mean, there's quite high proportions of them are still in unpaid labour in the home, higher than the average um, number. But I think that that is something which is... Um, if you look at where those women are working, they're working in a range of things, retail and... Um, and uh, all sorts of other things, which isn't just the caring uh, uh, occupation. So whether you can just say that all of this is about social reproduction jobs, I think it's very important, the role of um, these sorts of jobs, these caring jobs. But I think if you look at migrant labour and female migrant labour, it takes much, much wider forms in many, uh, in many instances. So those are the kind of questions I wanted to I wanted to raise and I just um, I just like to say thank you very much for for doing this and I think that um, th this is a topic that really is of such importance to people it isn't going to go away it's a, there's many many complicated questions and difficult questions and so on but it's a topic we really should see as very very central to the way in which we think about things in our society. All right, uh, thank you. So uh, before opening up to the floor, uh, I mentioned this leaflet that you got, which is about Sarah's new book, and it has a discount code on it. So if you want to buy it, definitely keep it. So um, I'll open up to questions, and uh, we'll try to take three to four questions at once, seeing. And if possible, try to keep them short. Thanks. So, yep. <coughs> Sarah, you've got uh, another book to write because the Islamophobia is virulently generated in the United States with Israeli lobby. The, uh, the, uh, the Israeli lobby and the Zionist lobby. Even the whole of uh, Congress and the Washington is occupied by, it's a territory, you see, by Israeli lobby. Nothing is raised, you see, where amount of Volume hundredfold uh, Islamic phobia is generated in the United States, and here I think uh, you should look at and book another book, Sarah. You should write on that. <laughs> no pressure there. All right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Um, especially because you're looking at uh, European countries, do you see any parallels between the discourses you analyse and the ones that were used uh, during the colonial projects to legitimise the colonial pol political economy and uh, you know, discourses like the white uh, civilising project and black peril, for example? Hi, thank you. Um, two questions. One is, I would like to push you on your in invitation to stress the kind of difference between convergence or collision that you were talking about in terms of J Jasper Poir's work. Um, okay. So if you can offer a uh, larger theoretical um, argument for that. And I'm also wondering, um, maybe it's a silly question, but um, in the absence of the migrant crisis, how would you have presented the kind of growth of Islamophobia? Do you think it would have happened so rapidly or, um, or not? I don't know. Um, just kind of thinking about if the migrant crisis hadn't happened, how would we be talking about this today? In the absence of the migrant crisis? So. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, before I take the next one, uh, if people would like to move into the empty seats that are now available or sitting on the floor, it's much more comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, I loved your presentation. I'm actually enjoying the book very much. I think mine are just explicatory uh, questions. So when you talk about convergence between right-wing agendas and feminist agendas and neoliberal policies, I've 
like to know if you can unpack a little bit more which feminist agendas, because of course the feminism is plural, and if you're only talking about Western liberal feminism, what we know today as white feminism, or instead it's trickier than that, because then of course some of these claims can actually be used, as you said at the beginning, for emancipatory projects. So if you can talk a little bit about differentiating what you mean by feminist agendas. And the second is, uh, I think following from Lindsay's comment on work, uh, I wonder if you can actually spend some time to perhaps talk about the differences between the three cases. Because, for instance, if you look at the geography of social reproduction in Italy at the very least, it works very differently. So you don't have an incorporation of Muslim migrants, uh, Muslim migrant women as such, in those activities as yet. It doesn't mean that will not happen, but at the moment the estimates do not tell that story. So we have actually a geography of Latin Americans, uh, Eastern Europeans, etc. So I'm wondering if you can actually spend a few words on the differences on that. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I should. So thanks. Um, so thanks, Lindsay, a lot for those comments and questions. So I will begin uh, maybe addressing some of those. First of all, on second wave feminism, I, I would say I agree with you, and I agree that second wave feminism was not just uh, about uh, portraying uh, work as emancipatory. And in fact, uh, I would say that uh, um, sections of second wave feminism, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, the Marxist feminist uh, sections, um, sections or components of that movement, uh, always, uh, uh, and even the black feminist, uh, uh, always uh, uh, had the position that work, uh, waged work, was exploitative, and it was certainly not the realm for the liberation or emancipation of women. At the same time, when I, my argument in the book is actually a little bit of a critique of Nancy Fraser, because I think Nancy Fraser was the one, as you might remember in this uh, very well-known article about the, um, the ways in which second wave feminism has somehow created the ground for neoliberalism. I actually disagree with her argument because one of the things Nancy Fraser says in that article is that precisely the emphasis of the feminist in second wave on work as emancipatory was also one of the reasons why there are these affinities with neoliberalism. Now, I, I disagree with her on this point because I think that we need to historicize very concretely the demand that second wave feminists, the majority of them, had for women to enter the workforce. So second wave feminism really, uh, at least in continental Europe, I think in some ways the story is different in, uh, in the United States and the, in the UK, but at least in continental Europe coincides with so-called Fordism, and it's really towards the end of Fordism, which means that Fordism was a period as you know, in which, um, in which there was the so-called, the predominance of the so-called family wage and the male breadwinner, and the majority of women from working class background and middle class background were fundamentally confined at home, and I'm talking really about the continental European context here. So it was not just uh, middle class women who didn't go to, to work because there was a family wage, but it was also very much a working class uh, context. So I, the argument I try to make is that the feminists in this, during the second wave in the 70s, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s, uh, asking for jobs for women were actually operating and making the demand in a context in which women were confined at home. And in fact, it is the years in which we have the wages for housework campaign, in which the domestic labor debate is one of the most important discussions within Marxist feminism, but I would say feminism more generally. So that we, I think we need to understand the specific political demands in their own historical context, and we cannot abstract for those. That's, that's my way of saying that I am critical of those positions who try to blame second wave feminism. Uh, I don't think that's that simple. I think we understand the demands of those feminists in those specific contexts, and that's why I think so-called neoliberal feminism is actually very different because it's not about saying simply women have to go to work, but it's about saying work empowers you and so you need to work harder and harder in order to affirm yourself. So again, there is, is a different framework. 
so I guess we agree on this because I think you were saying something, something similar. Um, I would agree that in the UK, uh, that's why I want to stress that my work really uh, is only about these three continental European countries and not about the UK. And I'm sure there are ways in which what I'm saying perhaps does not apply to the UK. Because you are right that lots of women, um, Muslim women and migrant women in the UK are not just confined in the social reproductive sector. And that also has very much to do with the history of immigration in this country with the history of colonialism and immigration. Here, we've, in a way, we are already seeing here the third generation of migrants in the UK. In a country like Italy, it's just in the last five years that we talk about second generations. So also, it's, I think we need to see the differences in that sense. And I agree with you here, perhaps uh, these uh, political economic logic I am using, uh, it might not be necessarily uh, that apt. Although I would actually be very interested in seeing what happens in this country in civic, econo in, uh, civic integration programs. I would be interested to see what, I don't know, I don't have the answer, but it would be interesting to see if the civic integration programs in this country, what do they do to women, what do they tell them in terms of where do they can find a job and so forth. Because even in this country, Newly arrived migrant women still usually find jobs in these sectors. All the Eastern European women are working as cleaners. Um, and the same goes for Filipino women, South American women, and so forth. So I guess it also depends on the stages of immigration. It might not be the case for ethnic minority Muslim women, although actually I have a good story in London about the Muslim women, which is... Uh, um, you, there was an article in The Guardian a couple of years ago about uh, um, a, a, a new clean, it was not a clean, it was an elderly care company that got a prize uh, as the best uh, inter enterprise for ethnic minority people in London. And what, and what this company does, they specialize in elderly care, they provide elderly care to families, across London, and the, the company is based in Tower Hamlet. So they got the prize because their program was to help Muslim women in Tower Hamlet who are not uh, working to, to, to work and to emancipate and to integrate in society by doing elderly care work. So actually, I'm not saying this is generalizable, but I, I just thought it was an interesting example of how also, in, actually in this context, we, we find this kind of rhetoric. I will write another book, thank you. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know exactly that will be the topic, but um, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, thank you. It will take some time, though. I totally agree with your question about the colonial legacies. This, I, I write extensively about this in the book. I say we can't understand this double standard applied to migrant men and migrant women, Muslim men and Muslim women as these oppressors and victims uh, without understanding the colonial legacies, without understanding the colonial histories uh, of these representations. Uh, and I give examples looking at France uh, the, um, during the uh, occupation, the, colo the colon colonial occupation of Algeria. Already in the 1950s, uh, the French state was carrying out, the French army was carrying out the so called unveiling ceremonies. Uh, um, asking Muslim women with a veil to take it off. Uh, we find similar stories in Indonesia with the Dutch colonization, the colonization of, in, of Italy in Ethiopia and Eritrea is a little bit different, but we still, we don't have the unveiling ceremonies, but we have certainly this idea that the men are uncivilized and barbaric and the women they are, of course, also considered to be barbaric by the Italian colonizers, but they can, they can be sexual objects. There are lots of stories about how the Italian army was actually treating these women as sexual ob objects, but they are also redeemable. One of the, the reasons why migrant women usually are considered to be more redeemable than men is also because they are essential for the second generations. They are mothers, and they are considered to be 
the so-called vectors of integrations because they educate their children. And therefore, one of the main ideas is that we need to teach, to integrate, and even better, to assimilate these women to the values of our countries <coughs> so they can transmit those values to the children. And uh, one of the examples I have, which is very <coughs> telling, is, uh, the, for instance, in France, uh, the 2005 uh, riot, so-called riots, uh, were um, represented, were justified by saying, oh, these kids uh, um, um, just doing all these riots in the city, in the, in the periphery of the cities especially, they come from polygamic families, and therefore, these are families in which they don't receive a proper education. So we need to get rid of polygamy and we need to assimilate the women. This was said by Sarkozy, the uh, president of France, in 2006. So there was a very clear connection. There was a very clearly the idea these women need to be assimilated because they need to educate the, these kids properly. Um, on the convergences, no, there was, sorry, first the, the, the collusion, you asked me about uh, the collusion. I mean, as I said, really, um, I think, what, first of all, uh, I have to say, just Pua is dealing with the United States, I'm dealing with Europe, uh, and so the context is obviously very different. I just found that uh, I could not simply apply this idea of collusion to the European context because I don't think that it's necessarily a collusion that's taking place. I think uh, the ways in which these forces are converging is not necessarily, and very often is not at all, because they, there is an intention. Collusion made us think of a complicity, and I don't think there is necessarily a complicity. These actors uh, do not share the same platforms, uh, uh, for instance, in the mainstream media. But nonetheless, what I try to highlight is that uh, they are converging in this Islamophobic space. Uh, they are converging in this uh, uh, space uh, it, which allows them to say, uh, in, a, in a way that seems to be publicly legitimate, that uh, Muslim men are oppressors and misogynists and Muslim women are the victims. This is a kind of common sense uh, that is bringing together these very, poli very different uh, political um, forces. I, I would say the migrant crisis, uh, I think that the discourse would be exactly the same, because actually all these uh, discussions that, uh, that I reconstruct, uh, they, I reconstruct these histories from the early 2000s until 2013, so actually it's before the so-called migrant crisis. So I, I don't think the migration crisis changes anything to this kind of rhetoric. Someone also asked me, uh, I don't remember anymore, about, to say a little bit more about uh, um, the differences between uh, the agendas, maybe it was you, yeah. uh, and um, <coughs> also the differences between the countries. So the, the differences between the agendas. So maybe what I should say, okay. Sure. She's asking me uh, basically um, in what sense, what, what, in what sense are these feminist agendas using this feminationalist trope? So my answer to this would be that uh, what I look at in these countries is a very broad. Um, array of feminist forces. So as I said, it's not just the right-wing feminists, but it's also the left-wing feminists. All of them are uh, precisely what brings them together, even not physically in the same space, but what is ideologically bringing them together is the strong <coughs> emphasis on Islam being a misogynist religion as the most uh, as the quintessentially misogynist religion, in a way that all these feminists foreground that Islam is actually the, the main repository of, uh, of misogyny. Now, what I try to say in the book that is that there is not one feminist agenda. Obviously, the right-wing feminists have a different agenda from the left-wing feminists. We can't bring together, you're Italian, right? So we, you, you can't um, bring together swats by, for example, uh, or the, the women involved the, in the union, the UDI, Union of Italian Women, which used to be close to the Communist Party. They are very different, and they have different agendas. But nonetheless, um, 
They both, for example, have endorsed the anti-veil anti bans and the UDI, the women of the, these left-wing organizations were in favor of the anti-Burka ban, of the full veil bans, for example. And what I say in the book is that it seems to me what brings them together is a form of what I call a Western supremacism, which is the idea that they share that the gender relations in the West are superior than those in the rest of the world. And so even though these feminists come from different places, they tend to share this idea. So in a way, um, I, I, I was tempted, when I was writing the book, I remember I was tempted to call, because I was really struggling to understand what does bring them together? They are so different. Why, what is the, the, the common ideological matrix that all allows them all to say Islam is the, the real danger without seeing how actually this is building racism and Islamophobia? And uh, I don't think that the framework of secularism, for, exa for example, works. Because uh, it's not just secular uh, women who are actually endorsing these arguments. I'm thinking of France where the idea of laicite and secularism is very strong, but it's not just secular women. I think more fundamentally than that is really this idea that the West is superior to the rest when it comes to gender relations. In the West, we have more advanced relationships amongst the genders, and we need to teach this to other women who might be more backward because of their histories and so forth. So I think the notion of Western supremacism, it seems to me at least, is a good way of making sense of these um, convergences in the, in the feminist camp. And when you ask about the difference between the countries, I, um, I would say that in one way, I think you're right, Muslim women, for instance, in Italy are not necessarily only employed in, in care and domestic work, although they actually are much more than we think. I'm increasingly discovering myself doing work in, um, on, 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 on Muslim women in domestic and care work, also in the country. They tend to be employed in the sector differently than Eastern European women. So lots of studies actually recently show that Muslim women tend to work much less or not at all as badanti, so they tend not to leave in the family with the, the person they care for, but they tend much more to do like uh, cleaning for a few hours a week. So there is a difference. But it seems to me nonetheless that that seems to be the prevalent job even for many um, Muslim women. But apart from that, my argument is that precisely we shouldn't look at just at this discussion, as this discourse as pertaining Muslim women. That's why I talk also about non-Western migrant women, because I think it also extends beyond the, the Muslim women. All right, let's do another round of questions. Um, yep. uh, hi, Sarah. Thanks for the fascinating talk. My question is basically related to what you just said. Uh, you seem to suggest that the ideological threat is what causes this convergence. So it seems to me it is more of an ideological explanation rather than a political economy explanation which you you state is the most important paragraph uh, in your book. Uh, so my question is, I guess, I'm trying to understand what is the link between the ideological uh, phenomenon and the political economy explanation because it seems to me like ideology is more important and this is not new, right? This, is, this was the case in colonialism, that was what they did and this is what Joseph Massad says, the liberal missionary project and I fail to see how the political economy side is more important than the ideological explanation. Okay. Just a clarification. All right, let's take another one. Um, there is one there. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I have uh, questions to both uh, Lindsay and Sarah. So starting with Lindsay on the comments, um, what Sarah said, um, and you were mentioning that um, Muslim women mostly disagree with Marxist feminism, and I would like to know um, more about um, what you think uh, is actually known in the West about the different types of feminisms in, um, in the Muslim societies around the world. And um, 
because we know that femini there are different feminisms depending on different contexts and cultures. Uh, so I'd like to have your point on that. And then um, for Sarah, um, you just talked about the Western supremacism, uh, pr supremacist view. And uh, what do you actually think? Because you were uh, focusing how I understand this, uh, the book mostly on immigrants and, and migrant, migrant Muslim women. Do you think, uh, what do you think would change if we would look at the, at the position of Muslim nationals, so Muslim citizens, uh, female citizens that actually are Muslim, but citizens since a longer time or they, they grew up there, so they have different uh, identities. Um, identifying themselves, for example, as French and Muslim, and do you think that there is space for Muslim European women in the media to create uh, more transparency on this topic? Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I had a question about your idea of um, work as emancipation and volunteering work particularly. I think that's a really interesting um, idea. Often, even for me, as a white Western woman, volunteering has been touted as a way of um, future employment and a way to be self-sufficient. So I don't think it's just um, for immigrants. Um, why do you think it is that women, this is a kind of anti-feminism by the back door, so to speak, in the name of emancipating women, these women are in fact, as your research shows, going into professions that are traditionally associated with domestic life? Why, why is that? Is that because their skills aren't recognised in our societies? Or what, what do you think the main reasons are for that? Um, I have a question for Dr. Sarah. Um, before I ask my question, I will have to ask your forgiveness for my ignorance because from the part of the world where I come from, there isn't as much discourse about Islamophobia and the migrant crisis as much as it should be. And so, where, where are you from? I'm from India and uh, I've grown up in Saudi Arabia. So again, not talked about as much as it should be. Um, the question being that in context of the three countries that you are discussing in your book, um, do those uh, governments through their integration programs take into consideration whether or not the migrant coming in is a skilled worker or a qualified person? Mm -hmm. And if they do so, would that then render the integration program in a more positive and more beneficial to the public interest? Thank you. Thank you, it was very interesting. Um, is there perhaps a double standard within the double standard of the uh, non-Western Muslim man as a rapist and sexual predator and the woman as victim? I'm thinking of this case, maybe it's an anomaly in France, where police rather violently forced a Muslim woman to remove her veil on the beach. And she was used as a threat, a symbol of a threat, so not at all a victim. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that. And if I can add a second question, and I ask this as a Syrian immigrant, in your research or in your work, what is the prise de conscience of women involved in this themselves? Is there dialogue within these communities? Have you encountered that? And can you comment on that? Thank you. What, just on the... Um, is that on? Can people hear me? Yeah. Um, just on the question that, that I was asked about the... I don't know whether you maybe misunderstood what I said. I wasn't saying that um, Marxist feminists were hostile to Muslim feminists, although some are, but uh, many of them, I think, would be in support of it. I think the problem is with feminism is that it started in the United States and was an absolutely huge movement there. It then kind of went to Europe before it went and, and came here, Italy a little bit later, you know, by the mid-1970s. 
and it never really i mean it was it was inspired by lots of anti colonial struggles i mean it was called women's liberation in identification with the vietnamese people who were fighting against the Americans. So it was inspired by those sort of things, but it didn't particularly take root that quickly in the developing world. And of course, what's happened is lots of feminists have, have since then have developed all sorts of ideas in India, in, um, in Afghanistan. I mean, there's a very good book by somebody who used to be, I don't know if she's still, she's retired, I think, Ellie. Elahi Rasami Povi, who wrote a very good book about Afghan women, and said, look, you know, we don't really need Western feminists or indeed Western men or anybody to tell us what we already know, and we're developing our own ideas. So I think, I think there's a lot of ignorance about these questions, you know, the idea that there can't possibly be um, feminism in, in some countries, or even the idea that if you wear a veil or you wear a burqa or you wear, for whatever reason that people do, that that prevents you from uh, developing, you know, egalitarian ideas, feminist ideas and so on. So I, th I think the attitude of us in countries like Britain should be that we need to find out and engage with what is going on in different parts of the world and not treat it as a kind of imperial project, which is always the danger. I mean, this is, you know, Sarah referred to Laura Bush and Cherie Blair in this country. I mean, the Afghan war, we were told this was about liberating women. They went on the radio and, you know, they did radio broadcasts saying, you know, these women are going to tear off their veils when we go and bomb them. They even got a few women to tear off their veils, but... Of course, it wasn't really about that, as I guess most of us realise it was about much more fundamental things. So, you know, they use these kind of things in actually a way that benefits imperialism and benefits neoliberalism. And I think we have to say that's wrong and we need much more discussion about what feminism and, to my mind, what socialism means in different parts of the world and how we can actually integrate those ideas within different societies. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Sorry, can you? <laughs> Do you think there uh, can be a contradiction uh, between Western feminism and, for example, Muslim feminism or feminism in some countries that are uh, Muslim majority countries? Do you think that can be actually contradictory? In what sense? In the sense that it's. In the sense that liberation means for women in, in some countries something else than for women in. Well, I think this is a kind of misunderstanding of what liberation is about. I mean, for me, liberation isn't actually about how you dress. You know, liberation, I mean, people should be able to dress exactly how they want, and as far as I'm concerned, that's end of. You want to wear makeup, you want to wear a veil, you want to wear a bikini, I don't really care. I mean, you know, it's not really, it's not really that important. So I think liberation is about something much more fundamental, which is probably, you know, I mean, I'm a socialist and a Marxist, so I would like to see a much more systematic change of society. And that's what liberation is about. Now, of course, people in different cultures, in different countries, have different ideas about what that might mean. But I think for all of us it means an end of oppression within the family, an end of anybody telling people what to do, and people collectively deciding how they want to bring up children, how they want to work, how they want to do all those sorts of things. So that's my kind of view of it. So I don't think there's a contradiction at heart, but I think very often the way it's projected particularly with some of the women that Sarah's been talking about in her book, I think there is a contradiction there because they're not really interested in... You know, we're told that we need modernisation. I noticed Tony Blair saying we need modernisation. Saudi Arabia is leading the way to modernisation by having a kind of palace coup or whatever's going on there. But, you know, modernisation would start with ending colonial rule and ending imperialism. That's how it would start, not by whether women wear a veil or not. I mean, I'm in favour of them not having to in Iran or in Saudi Arabia or anywhere else. But I'm also in favour of women having the right to wear what they want in France, in Britain. You know, I think this is something that's... That's the beginning of liberation. It's not the end. Yeah, well, um, your question about uh, the ideological, you seem to oppose ideological, the ideological aspects and the political economic aspects, uh, if I understood <coughs> your question. So my answer to you would be that uh, 
Actually, I understand the ideology, in a, in a, at least in this book, uh, and uh, with some caveats there, it, in the ways in which Louis Althusser and uh, Stuart Hall also talked about ideology. One of the important lessons for me from Louis Althusser, for example, who is this uh, uh, Marxist philosopher, from, French philosopher from the 1970s, uh, is that uh, uh, we need to understand the material aspects of ideology. Ideology is not just a free-floating free discourse, as if there is not a material root behind ideology. Even behind ideologies, usually there are material roots, there are material interests. There are reasons why we have certain ideas that are circulated rather than others. Uh, there is, for instance, uh, just to give you a little example, there is a very material reason why um, the neoliberal ideology is that of free choice. It's not simply, it's not at all in fact, because neoliberals care that much about people uh, having free choice of uh, choosing perhaps between one service and another service. But it's precisely because the ideology of free choice actually has enabled neoliberals and the neoliberal project in the last 30 years to privatize all sorts of sectors under the idea, under the banner that people need to choose freely. They can't just have the public childcare setting because that means they can't choose. There is only one, and so there is not really the respect for individual choices. This is just an example. So I would say that I don't see an opposition between political economy and ideology. For me, the point was precisely to understand <coughs> that the material aspects the, behind the ideology of human nationalism in this Althusserian way. And also Stuart Hall says something similar about the UK, and he talks about ideological formations. Um, there was a very... Someone asked me, maybe it was you, the Muslim women who are not migrants, what happens to them? So I give you two examples, again, from the countries that I study. In France, for example, I did research a few years ago, before I began to do this book project, uh, about the transition from school to work of young Muslim women. So we are talking about second or third generation Muslim women who are French. They were born in France, they identify as French. Very often they don't wear the veil, they don't even speak uh, Arabic, so they are fully French. So what it was really striking for me was uh, to discover in these interviews we did with these young women in Marseille and in Paris, uh, that many of them, those who didn't continue, who, those who didn't go to university, and who stopped after the baccalaureate, after the... Um, secondary school. Usually, they, the, the way in France it works is that uh, young people who want to find jobs go to these agencies. In France, they are called mission locale for these young women. And so they, they are helped to, the, to build their CVs. Uh, and you know they are also given information about the kind of companies that are searching for people. So it's a place where you can find a job. And usually, these young women told us that when they went to this mission locale, they were systematically sent to, to do jobs for childcare and cleaning. And they thought they were actually struck by that because they said, I remember one of them particularly saying, but we have a baccalaureate, we have studied, so why do I have to do cleaning jobs? And it was actually, we found one reason why they were sent to do these jobs was because usually they were the low skill jobs available for which there is a low supply of uh, lots of women don't want to do these jobs and there is a reason for that they paid very badly uh, they have very little rights and so forth the second reason there was a systematic form of racist discrimination against these women even though they are french they have uh, arabic sounding names and therefore uh, you know usually those are the jobs for the migrants for the arabs and uh, there is a very strong form of, um, what they say, post-code discrimination or surname discrimination. So automatically, these mig or these, even if there are no migrants, uh, and, but they have migrant-sounding names, uh, they are sent to these kind of jobs. So I'm not saying that this happens to all Muslim women, but certainly it's one of the main um, 
I would say, niches of the labor market, even for Muslim women who are not migrants. The second example is from the Netherlands, where, again, Muslim women, particularly from Turkey and Morocco, who are the main communities in the Netherlands, even when they are not migrants, and they are, in fact, Dutch, um, Dutch women, uh, if they don't work, they are actually sent letters by the municipalities in which they are actually invited to do either volunteer work in their neighborhoods and communities, schools, for example, or they are actually invited to, to work in, in, uh, in these elderly care sectors. Because there, there is a huge demand for these jobs in these sectors, sorry, for, for people in these sectors. And uh, so again, these are, not, these are not migrants. One of the slides I didn't show you actually um, was about how, I, I've written extensively on this, is about how during the recent economic crisis, 2007-2011, um, there are various, uh, I, I've done research on some countries, but actually it's something that is quite well known for those who have worked on this. So you, we can see that there is a big difference between the ways in which the crisis has affected male migrants and female migrants. So male migrants mostly employed in manufacturing and construction, they were very badly affected by the crisis. Many of them lost their jobs because the crisis affected specifically the sectors of the economy. The women employed, the migrant women employed in um, social reproduction, so cleaning, uh, babysitting, childcare, and so forth, actually, they, their sectors even grew during the crisis. So these sectors were not affected by the crisis, and these all studies have, show, have shown this. This is just a way of, of saying that uh, one of the reasons why I think there is so much emphasis on rescuing, integrating, assimilating these women is because the demand uh, the demand for, for people to work in these sectors is growing. And the reason why it's growing is because also we are, in Europe there is an aging population and uh, more and more elderly people are you know, pre 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 projected to need someone to care for them. Women are increasingly native, uh, whatever that means. Uh, women are increasingly working uh, outside the household. They are not willing uh, to, to go back if they have jobs. And so there is someone who, you know, who needs to take care of children, someone needs to take care of elderly people, so many native women are not uh, willing you know, to go back to for these times in which they were actually the main carers at home. So these are some of the structural reasons explaining why the demand for carers in Europe is so high. It is, this demand is increasingly met by, by these women. And that's my argument. That's why everyone wants to rescue them. Because without them, these economies are collapsing. There is no one doing these jobs. I mean, putting it very, in a way, um, not everyone wants to rescue them. Because obviously, it's a bit of a rhetorical way of putting it. But you understand what I'm saying. Um, and I think this also answers, uh, someone asked me, why are these women channeled to work towards social reproduction? I think I just answered this. This is precisely the reason. These sectors are growing. I think it was maybe you. These sectors are growing. And so, you know, that's really the reason. The skilled migration, actually, that's a very good question because uh, um, it actually allows me to say one reason why civic integration programs uh, are, well, I should say first, civic integration programs uh, the, the programs I described, they are meant exclusively for low-skilled migrants. So-called uh, high-skilled migrants usually don't go through the civic integration programs. And that's because at the European level, uh, since the mid-2000s, I believe, maybe before, Europe has created two tires for migrants. One is for high-skilled migrants. They, you know, usually very pampered, no one bothers them. They get, you know, it's much easier for them to get visas and residency permits. And uh, another tire is for low-skilled migrants. Those are the ones who are increasingly unwanted, in a way. So it's harder for them to get visas, and it's harder for them to, um, you know, to be allowed to get residencies. This, in spite of the fact that they are very needed by uh, the European economies, but obviously, Within the European Union framework, not all migrants, I'm talking about overseas migrants, migrants who are 
you know, no part of the European Union, so those who need residency permits and so forth. So for these migrants, particularly because Eastern European migrants have increasingly provided the labor force for the low-skilled jobs, is increasingly hard for those outside of Schengen, outside of the European Union, to get jobs for low-skilled, um, to, to get low-skilled jobs. So actually, I hope this answers the questions. And uh, I think there was one final question on the Burkini. Women are not just uh, victims. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, this is, um, I mean, this is a, a great question, and uh, I think you're right. Uh, I would say that, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure the Burkini example is the best example, though, because I think that even in the Burkini, the case of the woman who was uh, uh, obliged to undress uh, on the beach, uh, you asked me, obliged to undress on the beach because she had a Burkini, I think there was still Two, let's say two representations of migrant women, of Muslim women, were operating there. On the one hand, she was still a victim, because the idea that is that Muslim women, when they wear burkini or a veil, they are not doing that. They are victims of their cultures. They are not doing that freely. They are obliged by their fathers, their brothers, and so forth. So that's the main narrative in France. But you're right, I think that on the other hand, there was also a second uh, representation operating, which was that the ship could be a threat, especially a threat to secularism and laicite. But I would say that um, if I had to write the book now, I would probably stress this element much more, because I think that particularly in the last four years, so in a way when I had already finished the, 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 the book project, there is more emphasis, particularly in countries like, uh, um, like uh, France and the UK, on Muslim women being a threat, particularly in the case of all those young Muslim women who joined ISIS, who fled to Syria, and so forth. I don't think this means that uh, the representation of Muslim women as a victim doesn't exist anymore. I think these re the representations still coexist. But I would say that in the last few years, there has been also more emphasis on Muslim women also as a threat. So yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. OK, so we're going to have to finish now. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. And please join me in thanking Sarah and Lindsay.